Hi, welcome to a new series of Code Orange videos that explain everything we do in a season. Today, we will be breaking down what the team does from kickoff day to the off season. When solving any task in engineering, there's 10 steps that are used not only on our team, but through all of engineering. The first step is to identify the problem. For us, that's our game strategy. What is it that we want to do? Then it's, we have to generate specifications. What is everything that a robot can do? And then we decide what's the most important of those things. What do we need to do? What do we hope to do? And what would be nice to do if we had time? And then we brainstorm all the ways that this could be solved. It's important when generating specifications not to identify how it's done, just what can be done. Step four is when we identify how it can be done for the first time. And then we begin to prototype ideas. We make them often out of wood because it's easy to work with, but prototypes can be made out of anything. And they're quickly made and we learn concepts and they are for learning and prototypes will never go on the robot. Then we choose the best prototype. We choose the concept that we like and how it works. And then it's time for our detailed design. We put it in the cab who gets all our measurements exact and works everything out down to the smallest detail so that when we manufacture it and implement all the ideas, it's a smooth process. Then once it's completely done, we look at how it worked. Did it what worked well? What didn't work well? What can be made better? And finally, we iterate. Iteration is a key part of the 10 step design process. Iteration is what allows us to learn and get better. After we know what works and what doesn't work, it's we have to apply it and we prototype again, we choose new, better concepts, we design and we manufacture them again, and then we continue to analyze. And this loop repeats up until the retirement of our robot. And in real life, it repeats forever. Now, before we begin the 10 step design process, it's important to make sure you understand the rules. So each year's game comes with a game manual. Make sure you read it thoroughly and go through every rule that might be important. Today, I'm going to go through some of the important rules from this year's game, Infinite Recharge, and how it applied to our robot design. So in game strategy, the first thing that we noticed is that there were safe zones. Safe zones are very important because they allow the robot to be protected when it's doing what it needs to do. So we had to think of where can we position ourselves to make the best use of these safe zones. Next thing we noticed was that there were balls pre-positioned on the field. This was extremely important for autonomous because it's what allowed us to devise a key path through the field so that we can get the maximum number of balls and score the maximum number of points in the least amount of time. The next thing we noticed was that there was a large distance between where we had to pick up the balls and where we had to deliver the balls. This would make a cycling process much harder unless we found a better way, which we noticed that in the rules, it said that only 15 balls could be stored. So with a fast enough large cycle, we could pick up the overloaded balls from the, our opponent's feeder station and feed them right back into our own goal. This played heavily into the design of our shooter because we wanted to be able to shoot from our close safe zone. Next thing we noticed is the middle safe zones. There are only safe zones in the last 15 seconds, but that is extremely important. That this is the key rule that made us decide that we had to have a short bot. Let's play out a scenario. Let's say we're a tall robot on the Red Alliance, and our partners have decided to climb on the close side of the generator switch. Even in a scenario where none of the other robots are in the way, the only way that we could get to our side of the generator switch would be to go through the blue rendezvous point, which would be far too risky because any robot that touches us inflicts a severe penalty. Therefore, the only safe way for us to be able to get to the our side of the generator switch is to go around, which will require us to be a short bot. Now, let's look at some other strategies. This time, let's talk about the scoring. We made an important decision when designing our shooter and robot 
to only shoot for the top goal. This is because we notice that when shooting in the top goal, the path that you have to travel is only half the field. However, when you shoot in the bottom goal, you would have to travel all the way across the field. You cannot shoot into the bottom goal. Therefore, we decided if we took only half the field, we could make our cycles much faster. Now that we have decided a game strategy, it's time to create a list of specs that a robot could have. This includes anything from the ability to drive to all the different ways to score. Remember to focus more on what the robot should do and not how the robot will do it. This list is not what you want to accomplish, but rather everything that could be accomplished. After we have listed all the specs, we begin to rank each one using the Wish Preferred Demand System. The Wish Preferred Demand System ranks specifications based on how much effort the team is willing to put into it. Demand means we are willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Prefer means we will work on it, but we may drop it if there are too many speed bumps. Wish means we will only work on it after the demands and prefers are done. It's very important that the whole team reaches consensus on each ranking because it ensures that each decision is logical. If each ranking is discussed thoroughly, it means that the final choice has the most robust reasoning. Our team doesn't like to vote based on the majority because it discourages the minority from sharing their reasoning. There have been cases in previous years where a single person with a different idea was able to convince everyone else that the other option was better. Here are some examples of what we did for the 2019 game. We originally thought that picking up hatches was a wish because we assumed not very many people would drop hatches. However, someone brought up that in the 2017 game, we thought no one would drop gears, but people still did. And teams without a ground gear intake were at a disadvantage. After a long discussion, we decided that to compete at the highest level of play, a ground hatch intake was actually a demand. Another discussion we had was whether we wanted to control which side we scored the cargo in the rocket. At first, we believed it was definitely a demand because we wanted to be able to score points during endgame if there wasn't a hatch on one side. After taking a step back, we realized that scoring four ranking points in a match was also a demand. That meant that in most cases, all the hatches should be on in endgame. This made us change it from a demand to a prefer. You may notice that we have a lot of demands on our list. As a bigger team with more resources and members, we are able to put forth the effort required for lots of demands. If your team is a bit smaller, make sure to consider the amount of work that your team is willing or able to put forth. Don't let this discourage your team though, because there are still many teams who are able to compete even at the Einstein level just by focusing their efforts into doing one task very well. Given all the specifications, we come up with different ideas on how to complete the tasks that we want to do. This process may take a while, but it's very important for prototyping. Here's an example from 2019. Next, we go into groups of two to three to draw a robot that includes everything we want. The drawing should show how all the different parts of the robot interact with each other and fit together. These napkin sketches are then presented to the team for discussion. With all of our ideas on paper and whiteboards, it was time to begin prototyping. Prototyping is a time to learn what does and doesn't work. And because prototyping's main idea is to learn, it's extremely important to video every test and document every result so that when it's time to choose the final concept, the team can make an educated decision. With all the prototypes done, we chose a final concept for the robot. This year, we made our full robot out of wood so that we would understand how everything worked and see any flaws that there were. While this is not a requirement for every team to do, it was extremely helpful and a large learning opportunity for our team. Once we have made an effective prototype, we begin to use the information we found to create a 3D model in SOLIDWORKS. Students who are on the CAD subteam spend a few weeks to finalize the robot CAD, which will be passed to the manufacturing subteam through drawing. 
Students who work on the robot CAD need to find a way to package all the things that the team wants in a simple way. It's much cheaper and more time efficient for us to design and edit CAD rather than build a bunch of robots in real life. This means that every component should be included in the CAD to ensure a smooth assembly process. The final CAD must be approved by technical mentors to prevent time-wasting mistakes. Once you have the detailed design, follow your drawings and assemble the robot as specified. And then take a look back and see how well it did. The best way to analyze is often at competitions, but you can also analyze anywhere at practice fields or even just driving around your workshop. There's always time and areas to improve your robot. It's also very critical to not only look at the flaws and benefits of your robot, but to look at how other teams solve problems that your team may have had trouble with and always be improving. Iteration is the final step. Once you analyzed it, you know what needs to be fixed and you know what can get better. And remember, not just things that are broken can get better. Even things that work great can always be better. And make sure to take inspiration not just from your own team members, but from members of other teams and see how they solve the problems. Here, I have shown examples of iteration from some of our previous year's robots. In the top left is our 2017 robot, where we originally thought that it would be a good idea to have two turrets. However, after reconsidering and looking at other teams' robots, we realized that only one would work much better. Next is our 2018 intake. In this iteration, the top row is what we had in season and the bottom is actually out of season. After champs, we decided to redesign our intake based on the 254 intake, and it worked very well for us in our off-season competitions. In the middle, is a design process iteration that happened even just within CAD. We originally were going to use ramps. However, after looking at the complexity of it and its weight, we realized that it would weigh less and be much easier for us if we only used forks. Underneath is another iteration that happened in the off season. This one is a very small iteration, an example that iteration can happen anywhere and for any reason. We had a problem during season where we had a little bit of trouble just tensioning the ropes of our elevator. However, in the off season, we replaced the eye bolt that was originally there with a ratcheting wrench that allowed us to tension much easier and much more than the eye bolts allowed us to. This small little change drastically made our experience in the pit a lot easier. Finally, you can see that iteration can happen anywhere and anyhow. At our field, we had a broken intake, and we, to decide how to redesign it, we used a pizza box and just cut it into the shape that we thought would work best and iterated on that so that when we went back to the CAD, we could know what worked best. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.